January 12, 2021 um, work session. And I'm going to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Mr. Chambers? Here. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Lee? Here. Mr. Mullins? Here. Mr. Reynolds? Here. Ms. Schenholster? Here. Ms. Walden? Here. All right, so we do have a quorum present. Um, if you've looked at your packet, you see something a little differently uh, in the year 2021. On our work sessions uh, from here on out, we'll have mayor's comments. And so tonight I had a few comments that uh, I wanted to go over with you all. However, uh, in, discussing, in our discussion this morning with Mr. Griffith and Mr. Jordan, I'm going to hold off on those comments um, until we can get together on it. Mr. Uh, Griffin, is that okay with you? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to the city manager since we have quite a few presentations uh, and for the sake of, of time. Um, thank you, Mayor. I, I emailed you all some information um, this morning and most of it was purely for information and I, I will uh, go over uh, each of those information pieces that I emailed you. Uh, but there is one that, um, uh, while it's not well, it's certainly not the way I like to do things, that I'll be asking you all to to consider amending the agenda tonight to pass a resolution that you all receive later in the day today, um, and it's basically on extending the COVID uh, staff pay. Um, most of you probably are aware that, um, and I actually shared this with you all. About a week ago, I guess, that um, the uh, Family First uh, Coronavirus uh, Relief Act, which was one of the pieces of federal legislation that came about because of COVID, um, was a piece of federal legislation that uh, provided for uh, various levels of pay for staff members based on one of about six different situations um, with the biggest one that that we dealt with here at the city uh, being the ones where um, someone either had a positive um, diagnosis of covid or they were quarantining um, based on the fact that they they suspected that they had been exposed uh, or they were taking care of, uh, they were the caregiver of someone uh, who had had a positive diagnosis. And what the federal legislation did was uh, provide a mandate for paying those folks for two weeks of 100% um, of their pay rate um, uh, and uh, we were doing that based on the federal mandate and doing it out of the uh, phase one CARES Act money that we received. If you all remember, when we first received that CARES Act, those CARES Act funds, we anticipated that we would be receiving three phases of them. We got phase one did everything that we needed to do to get phase one. And then the governor chose to take the funds that we anticipated through phase two and phase three, uh, not just from us, obviously, from, from all over the state, to prop up the um, uh, unemployment insurance trust fund. Um, <clears throat> so we did not get those, uh, the second and, and, and third phase. Um, unfortunately, we had we had already made a list of items that we were going to purchase um, that would easily qualify for those um, funds, but uh, we were not able to um, to do that. But going back to phase one, I shared with you that I looked at a couple of different items to 
uh, decide on a recommendation to make to you tonight on this. First of all, was uh, the number of employees who had received either full or partial um, emergency paid leave or essential paid leave as the First Families Act referred to it as. And um, this, this is not saying that we had 54 cases of positive cases of COVID in our, in our staff, but 54 of our staff members uh, as of last Friday had received some portion of their emergency paid or essential paid leave, either partial or the full two weeks. Um, so I took that number and then um, the question was posed on the city manager's listserv um, uh, about basically what were cities doing in this situation um, as far as um, employees with emergency paid sick leave and paid expanded family medical leave um, we had um, we had uh, as of this afternoon about six um, cities that had responded that they had uh, excuse me four cities that had responded that they had continued the benefit at the city's expense uh, through the first quarter uh, we had one city that said that they had replenished the employees, as they called it, COVID bucket, uh, with 40 hours through the end of 2021, um, calendar year 2021. Um, six cities that said they were allowing employees to use whatever um, First Family Act remaining leave that they had as of 12-31-20. Uh, they were allowing them to use that through January 31st, 2021, and that they would evaluate another possible extension as they got closer to that date. Interestingly enough, two cities um, uh, uh, responded, and uh, Jimmy, you may find this interesting, that they plan to begin to differentiate by those, who, those employees who were eligible to receive the vaccine and if an employee was eligible to, re to receive the vaccine but refused to, be the, to receive the vaccine, then their absences would be treated the same as any other illness. So um, everything that I'm reading so far says that, that most likely, at least early on, uh, it's gonna have a hard time standing in court to, re be re to require employees to take the vaccine, but it appears that those two cities may be trying to come at that through, um, through a back door. So I looked at the number that we had that had received either full or partial essential paid leave, uh, what, what other cities were doing that responded to um, the, G, the city manager's listserv website, and then um, I started looking at uh, our expenditures of that Phase One CARES Act money uh, that we received. We received $979,111 in our Phase One um, figure. That's public information. You, you can find on, online what all cities and counties in the state received. Um, and thus far, uh, as I shared with y'all uh, in the email this morning, we have spent uh, $300,374.62 of that. Um, uh, that was spent on uh, cleaning uh, thus far by ServPro. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. Uh, PPE supplies that we had purchased for uh, city departments. Um, the actual COVID-19 pay under the Families First Act and then uh, overtime to some um, essential departments uh, for uh, covering shifts uh, when, um, when they had staff members that were out with COVID and those shifts needed to be covered. Um, I then estimated some future planned expenditures cleaning equipment and chemicals, $50,000. These are probably high, but I did $50,000 on that because we are in the process now of purchasing our own uh, hand fogger and our own fogging cart. 
that we will use in the future um, to clean our areas when necessary. Um, some uh, estimated additional PPE at uh, about $25,000. Uh, uh, estimated additional overtime uh, based on looking at what had been spent prior to this month and then estimated COVID-19 additional pay, meaning the extension of the two week uh, benefit. <coughs> So uh, those figures came up with 325,000, which means uh, if those figures are accurate based on what we spent to date, and, and, and as long as we don't spend any more than those expenditures that I predicted, and y'all know that I tend to predict very conservatively or liberally, depending on how you look at it, um, we should be able to take care of extending the two week benefit um, by using the CARES Act funds that we have and still have some total remaining uh, CARES Act to um, expend. So my recommendation is that we um, continue allowing employees to use whatever First Family um, Coronavirus Relief Act hours and remaining essential paid leave that they had as of as of December 31st 2020 when it expired from a federal mandate standpoint um, and that they be allowed to do that through the end of the current budget year June 30th 2021 I really vacillated back and forth about how long to do that um, and I finally just decided to ask you all to do it through the end of this budget year because quite frankly I think we're gonna still be dealing with COVID in June um, and uh, I wanted to not have to come back to you all every month unless you wanted me to to ask you if that could couldn't continue. Uh, anyone who has already utilized this provision uh, prior to this point uh, obviously will uh, not have the provision available to them uh, and they will either need to take sick leave or emergency family medical leave or a combination of the two uh, if they end up having to be out with COVID uh, again, so um, that's the way I came to my recommendation. If any of you have any questions on any of those figures, I know I threw a lot of figures out at you, and 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 I, I hate to ask you to do this tonight, but I think it's important for us to be able to deal with the upcoming uh, payrolls that we have ahead of us in order to be able to do that. So, any any questions from anybody on any of that information? What role did uh, the department heads play in coming to this conclusion uh, as far as the best way to handle this? Were they involved in the in the process? They were not. They were not. This, this was purely an analysis by me and a recommendation by me. I heard your uh, recommendation this morning, but I was kind of curious on what you said. Inter interestingly enough, uh, with the part about if they took the COVID exam, I mean, vaccination, um, that would give them an additional two weeks just by taking it or? No, no, that, the, the, way, the way the two cities looked at that mm -hmm. is, and, and I, I don't think we even need to think about going down that road, but uh, well, uh, reporting out on those two cities is, if someone in those two particular cities, if someone was eligible for the vaccine and they did not take it, mm -hmm. then they would not be provided any any expanded leave mm -hmm. past December 31st. I think that's the reason why I ask, because I'm, I'm just trying to, if you're on a tier level of how you get the vaccine, you know, how, how would they even? Well, I, I, I find that that's one of the things that I found kind of interesting and, and uh, as we have seen, even as late as this afternoon with the governor's news conference, um, you, you may fit a slot in phase 1A, but being able to get that appointment to get that vaccine is a totally different thing. Um, not to mention, you know, the people who may not be able to take it because of illness or may not take it because of religious beliefs or whatever. So um, I, I just I, I supplied that information just kind of thought because I thought it was kind of an interesting mm -hmm. point that those two cities made. Uh, both of the cities are in the metropolitan Atlanta area and uh, evidently counselor they have plenty of money to fight those lawsuits that may come down from that decision. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
Hank, I'm curious. That does to, seem somewhat questionable. <laughs> I'm curious to know, did the governor mention that the state cut it out completely as of 12-31-20? Uh, that this, this. Mm. Yes, sir. <laughs> it is he, he, he as did. As of 12 he, he did, 20, he did not. No longer so that's right. That's that money out for people COVID. out with COVID. Mm -hmm. You either go to emergency family medical leave and use your own leave. Right. Or you do leave without pay. Mm -hmm. That's the way they gave it to the employees. Right. Yeah, uh, or, or utilize your own funding. Your own funding. Uh, is, through is, your is own the request for tonight. Um, but yes, the, I think that, you're being generous. Of generous. all the things that the feds replaced with that last minute legislation, this was one that was not even, I don't think, even looked at. Yeah, I know. I didn't think the governor would an announce that, but that's exactly <laughs> what the state of Georgia did. Mm -hmm. They cut it out. They were saying it was becoming too easy for people to just. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't. They didn't care, mm -hmm. and so not worried about losing that pay because they had jobs, and they didn't care what they did. Right. So they ended up. It, it, and, I, and I can see both sides of it, because you know if you're asking people to do things and 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 practice social distancing, and then you have so many people that are saying, well, you know, it doesn't matter to me. I'm just going to be out because I'll get paid. Mm -hmm then you, you, they, they decided they needed to reel it in somehow. So that was one of the ways that when you start talking about people's pay, it makes a difference it, in, in their behavior. It absolutely does. And, and the, the thing that I will say is, with the exception of those people who obviously had to be out because of positive COVID diagnosis or because of potential exposure and just a few because of being caregivers to to uh, to folks who may have have uh, gotten a positive diagnosis for COVID, um, our people have continued to work at the city yeah. of Milledgeville, and that's that that for if for no other reason is the the reason why I wanted to bring this request for this extension to y'all because because these folks have worked. I know what he said was that. Um he thought that that would be a way for people to take it a little bit more serious than they've taken it so we can get a, ha get a handle on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then we never even got to the third of your pay, or what was it, 230 as it rolled down? We had, a, we had a few that were, that were in that regard uh, based on the fact that they were, um, uh, they either had to, they were caregivers for children when they had to be out for, uh, when the children were out of school, or maybe they had some older parents that they had to take care of. But uh, of that 54, it was probably less than five when you saved Mervyn? Two. two? Okay, two total. Mm -hmm. So of that 54, it was two that were either, were at that two thirds mm -hmm. uh, pay rate. So what happens if they, if they, if they get COVID la later? For and those particular people, the way the, the way my recommendation reads is, um, it they it would they would start looking at it an hourly standpoint at that point in time, mm -hmm. and if they were, let's just say they had they had eighty hours at two thirds of their pay, then after that said and done, they they have they have eighty hours at, at a third of their pay left, so those hours would be taken off because of the extension and then whatever was necessary after that would be on their sick leave or emergency family medical leave. So. Okay. Mm. So obviously if y'all have interest in amending the agenda and voting on that tonight, you can do that in the general uh, uh, or in the main meeting uh, and uh, I will entertain any questions at that point in time that you may have thought about while um, while we were wrapping up the, the work session. Um, just a couple of uh, pieces of information that uh, I've also sent you in the email. Um, you know, part of my request for having a work, se a work session after uh, prior to every meeting was so that I was not asked, giving you all information to vote on <laughs> before meeting, because that, that's not the way I want to do things. So I actually um, uh, sent you two pieces of information this morning that will be on the agenda uh, for the January 26th meeting. 
One is the IGA with Georgia College to um, construct the channelized island at West Montgomery and North Liberty. Uh, if you remember, we talked about that uh, definitely before Christmas, and it may have even been before Thanksgiving, that Georgia College had done the traffic study um, and uh, recommended the DOT, and DOT had accepted the recommendation to put an additional Hawk system uh, just east of that intersection uh, about the area where the young lady was was hit uh, in the, the uh, motor vehicle pedestrian accident uh, about this time last year, maybe a little bit later in January. Um, but DOT was going to require a channelized island there so that no one could turn left off of Liberty onto Montgomery. And um, that IGA was included in the email that I sent you today, so please read it and let me know uh, if you have any questions or any issues with it. Um, basically, Georgia College will um, pay for the construction of the channelized island, and then we will share in the maintenance of that in the future uh, should the need uh, arise. Uh, by the way, just as an aside, in case you haven't seen it, um, when the students get back, the um, scramble or barn dance, depending on who you talk to as to what it's called, will go into effect for Hancock and Clark Street, and it will be synced with the Hawk Crossing light at uh, on Hancock Street in front of Magnolia Ballroom. Uh, we talked about that a little bit, um, but basically what that is is the way that intersection will work is all of the all of the vehicle traffic will stop. Pedestrians can go all of which ways <laughs> across that intersection. And then pedestrians will stop and the vehicular traffic will go and then the vehicular traffic stops and pedestrians can cross any way they want to again. And then the Hawk system in front of Magnolia Ballroom uh, will be synced with that. So people will only be crossing at that light or in that crosswalk when people are crossing at Hancock and Clark. Um, I have seen one of these um, live, and that's in front of the bookstore at Georgia Tech. And um, seems to work pretty well up there. So it will be interesting to see how it works um, here. Uh, the one at Georgia Tech actually has hashed walkways um, diagonally through the intersection. I've noticed um, the one here, they've got the crosswalks shown, but they don't have them hashed all the way across the intersection. So I actually sent an email to DOT today asking them if they were going to do that uh, prior to opening that intersection. but. Um, that information is there, and I'll be happy to answer any questions about it that you all have over the coming two weeks. Um, I didn't uh, see anything in there about the right maintenance, quick. Hank. Ma'am? I, I noticed right in front of the diner hall, uh, from one corner, and it's hard to explain, but from one corner to the next corner, right in the middle of the intersection. You mean to tell me they can walk right in the middle of the intersection from one corner to another? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's very dangerous. Right. So, okay. so you'll notice there are walk, don't walk lights, lights at right angle to the intersection and diagonally to the intersection now. So, I don't see anything about. I know you said we had agreed to uh, the maintenance part on because I didn't see any figures. Did you give us some figures on? There are there are no or, figures in that IGA. If there is any maintenance, it will be based on the fact that. Um, the signage in that island has to be replaced because somebody hits it with a car um, or there may be some um, some ARA decals in the road that wear off throughout the use and those have to be uh, replaced but I don't anticipate any maintenance costs on that are going to be any great amount. It, most of it will be based on the fact that the island gets damaged some way, shape, form, or fashion. So. And so will they be keeping that, um, I think they normally keep a little security guard or somebody out there, kind of, will that person be staying on for a while? Are they going to do away with uh, it? No, once that Hawk system, it's my understanding, once that Hawk system 
You're talking about the one on Montgomery, right? right? Mm -hmm. Right. Once that hawk system becomes active, they will no longer have a police officer there. Because the way that hawk system works is when someone gets ready to cross the street there, they hit a button and it stops traffic. Uh, Mr. Mullins uh, asked about, you know, the, the sinking with the red light <coughs> at Wilkinson and Montgomery. And it will be synced with that light even now. But um, if you remember, one of the pieces of information that I gave him in answering that question was uh, if the barn dance works well at Hancock and Elbert, DOT is looking at the possibility of putting another one at Montgomery and Wilkinson, especially when the new science building gets open. Yes, okay. Okay. Um, Another piece of information I sent you was a draft contract for re-roofing uh, fire station number one on Thomas Street. Um, that had, has gone through the bid process and um, the contractor that you see in that information is, is the one that will be awarded that bid provided you all um, approve the mayor signing that contract. Uh, this was done in conjunction with the bid for re-roofing the police department. Um, that bid has not been uh, awarded yet because there's still still some negotiation on some rust proofing uh, that will be required for that building that will not be required for um, for the fire station. Uh, Miss Hewley took that through the appropriate bid process, uh, and Mr. Thomas was a part of um, the team that reviewed those bids and made their recommendations to um, the contractors that were chosen for those. So um, the contractors listed in there, the price is listed in there, the scope of work is listed in there. So take a look at that and let me know if you have any questions. Um, also included in that information was uh, a, a letter that had been emailed to me by Mr. Couch uh, responding to um, uh, the line of credit payment request that Mr. Jordan uh, sent. Uh, I had shared with you all um, via email some potential ways to, uh, to get at that uh, in terms of either, either payment or conveyance of land. Um, so you all have that information. Just let me know if you want me to proceed with talking to Mr. Couch about potential conveyance of land or if you want to hold fast to your line of credit um, cash payment uh, information that was sent by Mr. Jordan. Um, and lastly, in the piece of, uh, or the email that I sent you today, uh, we had talked about the possibility of having a planning meeting this past Saturday and with our COVID numbers, uh, I, I suggested that we put that off um, and suggested maybe looking at January 30th. Um, just uh, let me know your thoughts over the next week or so about uh, a planning meeting on January 30th. Uh, I guess if numbers are still high, we could do it by <laughs> Zoom. I think the mayor was interested in having everybody in the same room, but um, depending on what numbers look like, a Zoom session would probably be better than nothing. It's my understanding from the mayor that you all have some interest in hearing from department heads. So I certainly want to give you all the opportunity to do that and to be able to ask them any questions that you have. Um, the, 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 the one place I, I may have messed up in a lot of places, but the one place I did mess up in our planning session uh, last January was that I did not, I did not uh, allow enough time for um, you all to discuss what you would like your priorities to be for the city in the coming year. So um, the way I'm looking at doing that planning session when it occurs and if it occurs is to have department heads to talk to you and then um, just simply be quiet and listen to y'all and uh, let you all direct um, the priorities that you have an interest in and in fiscal year 2022, uh, actually calendar year 2021, but we'll cover part of fiscal year 2022. Um, what, the only other thing that I have uh, before we go into closed session is uh, just wanted to let you all know that um, myself and Chris uh, with George, Chris Brown with George College, Michael Gillett with George College, um, 
uh, have worked with uh, Nadira Mayweather, um, and we will be, um, uh, you all may know that the entire MLK uh, celebration, with the, with the exception of the day of service uh, this year in our community, will be virtual. And um, we have worked, uh, Georgia College, uh, through Chris and Michael and myself, have worked with Nadira, and uh, they will actually be utilizing the technology that we have in our council chambers in order to have their education night virtually on Thursday night, January 21st. Uh, that is when um, the three winners of the community essay contest have the opportunity to present their essay and then students will be a part of a panel where um, they will answer questions uh, from Nadira as she moderates that panel. Um, we've been very clear with them about the requirements for social distancing and masking. There probably will be very few people actually in the chambers with the exception of the folks uh, who are reading their essays and their parents. Uh, they actually have limited the students to two attendees with them and um, but we just have the technology here and and uh, Georgia College staff have been kind enough to work us through this situation and um, when it became apparent they needed somewhere a little bit bigger to do that that part of the virtual MLK week we were happy to step up so if any of you are interested at seven o'clock on Thursday January 21st uh, that will be occurring up here. If you don't want to come in person but want to watch it, let me know and I can send you the Zoom link that Georgia College has sent out for, um, for that. A um, couple of quick last things. I um, uh, just want to remind you that you all will need to elect a new uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem this year. Uh, whether it's uh, uh, Ms. Schenoster continuing in that role or whatever your pleasure is, we'll need to do that. Uh, I would say at the January 26th meeting, but um, I will let you all drive the schedule on that. Um, and also, Mayor, we need to talk about you doing a State of the City address as part of a council meeting sometime very soon. But uh, you and I can have that conversation and um, decide when that will be so uh, also uh, y'all probably know that uh, this is an election year and uh, counselor you and I'll be talking to make sure that I know what needs to be done Bo knows what needs to be done in terms of advertising and those kinds of things that are necessary I think early on in this year based on the fact that it is an election year so any questions <clears throat> All right. Well, um, Mayor, I think we have a couple items we need to deal with in closed session. So if there's no no questions for me, that's all I have. All right, then. If uh, there'll be no other discussion at this time, we would like to um, adjourn from, our, not adjourn, but convene on our regular session and move over into our closed session to discuss personnel and legal matters. Yeah. Dr. Lee? Here. Mr. Mullins? Here. Mr. Reynolds? Here. Ms. Schenholster? Here. Ms. Walden? Here. Did you hear me? Yes, yes ma'am. <laughs> okay. All right.